Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem contiguous array. We're given a binary array of nums, meaning it just consists of zero and one in the input array. And we want to return the maximum length of a continuous subarray with an equal number of zeros and ones. Thinking about subarrays, the immediate thing that I personally think of is how many subarrays does an array of size n have? It has n squared subarrays. So something like this, where let's say this is the input. We have a subarray here, here, here. Basically, we have n subarrays starting with the first element. Then we have roughly n subarrays starting with the second element and et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be n squared if we want to check every single subarray. So this is kind of our benchmark. Any solution we get should be better than an n squared solution if we can find one. With this type of problem, what I immediately try to do to optimize it is try something like maybe a sliding window. Is there a pattern here where we can intelligently kind of shift our window? And in this case, actually, there's not. And let me tell you why. Suppose we have this input array. We're counting the number of zeros and the number of ones. When we start, we have one one, and then we get two ones, and then we get three ones by the time we're over here. Obviously, the number is not equal yet. Now, we get to a point where we have a zero, and then we get a second zero. At this point, even though the number of these is actually not equal yet, there actually are a couple valid solutions. First of all, this is what we've seen so far, but this is a valid solution. It's of size two. This is a valid solution. It's of size four. This is our result so far. But if we were to try to do this with the sliding window, you tell me, how do we know if we should try to shift our window? How do we know if we should chop this guy and then shift our pointer over here? Because that is a possibility. But the other possibility is if we can somehow see into the future, we say that actually leave the pointer over there because we know eventually there's going to be another zero over here and then the size of the window becomes six. So the fact that we don't know which choice to make is going to mean that if we try to do it that way, it's going to end up recursive and then that's going to end up being much worse than an n squared solution. So sliding window isn't really possible here. That's not a horrible thing because we can kind of use the lessons that we just learned here to try to find a better solution. A possible naive approach, a possible maybe even you could call it a greedy approach would be to always start at the beginning, keep track of zeros and ones. And once they're equal, then we know that we have a valid window. But that's not always going to be the case. What I'm saying is that the result isn't always going to start at the beginning of the array. So changing the example a little bit, this is the result here. This is the window and it does not start at the beginning. I guess my question is maybe the general approach that we do is because what we're kind of looking for at this point, we know we have an n squared solution. So really we're looking for a linear time solution. Probably there isn't going to be an n log n solution for like this type of problem. So let's focus on looking for a linear time solution. Generally, my thought process with this is this is the ending point. We want to consider what's the longest subarray ending at this element. What is the longest subarray ending at this element, this element and every single element? And we should be able to do that for any particular element in constant time because we're going to have to do it for n elements. So if we do it in constant time, then we have a linear solution. OK, so that's the high level. But how exactly do we do this? How do we figure out that the longest subarray ending at this element happens to be this? How do we know it's not this, for example? And what about this guy? How do we know what's the longest subarray ending here? How do we know it's not this or it's not this? It happens to be this one in particular. Well, I'll tell you exactly why. First of all, we're going to use a lot of what we already talked about. We're going to keep track of the number of zeros and ones. By the time we get here, we know the number of zeros is two. We know the number of ones is three. If they were exactly equal, then that's great. That's easy. But this time they happen to not be exactly equal. If they were exactly equal, like for example, in this case where we have three zeros and three ones, this is the total number of zeros and ones throughout the whole subarray by the time that we get here. So 
if that's the case and these happen to be equal, then that's great. This is the easy part. But when they're not equal, like in this case, this is where things get more interesting because we know for sure that we cannot start at the beginning of the array. But at the same time, do you kind of notice something here? We have two zeros and three ones. If only there was a way for us to know where the first one is, that it happens to be over here. And if only there was a way for us to know that by removing this, we end up with an equal number of zeros and ones. And this is the valid result. And if only there was a way to do this all in constant time. Now, this example is pretty simple because what we can do is just remove a single element from the beginning of the array, but it might not always be that simple. We could have like a bunch of changing elements and the counts could be really skewed. We could have five zeros and three ones. And at that point, we are looking to remove two zeros from the beginning of the array. And I guess just to make this example a line up with this one, let me correct this real quick. For example, this more complicated one, we have five zeros and three ones. Like by the time what we get here, we're trying to remove two of the zeros so that the counts are equal. But there's no guarantee that we start with two zeros. That would be very clean and easy, but there's no guarantee of that. They could be ones, they could be zeros, they could be mix and matching. So instead of saying that what we're trying to do is remove zeros, what we do is something a bit more intelligent. It's not that we're trying to remove exactly two zeros from here. That's not what we're trying to do, actually. We are trying to remove a prefix of this array such that by removing that prefix, we end up with an equal number of zeros and an equal number of ones. And not only that, but we want this prefix to be as small as possible, like the minimum prefix that we need to remove to make the counts equal. So that's what we're trying to do. Now that you really understand exactly what we're trying to do, we can actually approach how we're gonna do that. Continuing with this complex example, I just wanna tell you that there isn't really a prefix in this case, right? That'll make the counts equal uh, if this was five. Like there just isn't a prefix. You can try every one and that won't happen. So let's go to the more simple example and talk about why that is. I'm gonna use a hash map here and let me tell you why. When we wanna remove a prefix, however large it happens to be, what we're saying is we want that prefix to have an extra one. We don't care how many ones it has. We don't care how many zeros it has. It just needs to have an extra one. So in this case, this is that prefix. It has exactly one occurrence of one and it has exactly zero occurrences of zero. Given this, if we remove this prefix, we don't change the number of zeros, but we change the number of ones to be two. And that's perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. Knowing this, knowing that it's the difference that we care about, how can we work backwards from here to the solution? Let me tell you, as we are iterating over this input array, not only are we gonna keep track of the total number of zeros and ones, at every index, we are going to take the difference between the number of ones and the number of zeros and then map that to the index. Just to review, we're mapping the difference in the counts to the index. For every position, we're gonna kind of do that. So first here, we'll have one, one and zero, zero. So we'll say one minus zero is gonna map to the index zero. What this means is that the first subarray with a difference of one, and the difference means the number of ones minus zeros, ends at index zero. And so that's just telling us that this subarray is the smallest subarray starting from the beginning. It's the smallest prefix where we have a surplus of one ones. In the future, if we were to see another subarray, I uh, suppose like this was the array, like this is also a surplus of a single one, if we have one, zero, and one. But we wouldn't wanna overwrite this to be one actually maps to index two because this subarray ends at index two. We would not wanna overwrite that because we want the smallest such subarray. We don't want a bigger subarray if we don't need it. That's pretty much all there is to the hash map approach. We'll do that for the others as well. So here two would map to index one, three would map to index 
2 because there's a surplus of 3 1s. And then here we'd get to surplus of 2 1s, so we don't overwrite this. And here we'd get to a surplus of 1 1, and we don't overwrite this. But at this point, what we would say is, okay, we have three ones and two zeros. Therefore, the number of extra ones is three minus two is equal to positive one. Okay, where does that subarray lie? What is the smallest subarray if it even exists? It might not exist. If it does, it's over here. It ends at index zero. Okay, index zero is here. So this is the subarray. This is the one that we're trying to remove. So right now we are at index four and this ended at index zero. So therefore, all we do is take four minus zero and that tells us the size of this subarray. That is the logic behind this problem. Just to quickly show you another example, before we even get to the ending over here, we would probably be over here, of course. At this point, the number of zeros would actually be one. The number of ones would be three. Again, we'll take the difference. Three minus one is gonna equal to two. Okay, let's do a lookup in our hash map, and it's over here, right? The diff is two, and the index is one. So the subarray ending here has a surplus of two ones, and that's what we're trying to remove, because once we do that, look at this, look at it. It is the exact subarray that we want. Now, this one is of size two. The other one that we just saw was of size four. So, of course, this would be the result. But again, just wanted to kind of walk through that. Clearly, the time complexity of this approach is going to be O of n, just iterating over the input, and O of n for the memory as well, because we are having a hash map here. Okay, let's code it up. Usually, when I solve these problems, I take notes like this. I don't know how helpful these types of notes are for you guys. I can include them in the videos if you do want to. I don't know how understandable these are, but it usually helps me to kind of organize my thoughts. We are going to count number of zeros and ones. Initially, both of them are going to be zero. We will have a result and that will initially be zero. That's what we're going to return. That's the max length. We'll also have that hash map that I talked about. I guess I'll call it diff index. Maybe there's a better name for it, but basically what it's going to do is count the diff. It's going to map the diff to the ending index of the subarray. And the way we're going to calculate the diff is going to take the count of ones and subtract the count of zero. You could do it the other way if you want to. It doesn't really make a difference. Just got to be consistent about it, though. Now, let's iterate over the input. Let's say for n in nums. And it turns out that we're actually going to need the index as well, because that's kind of what we're mapping it to. So let's do that at the beginning. Enumerate this so that we can get the index and the number at the same time. So now what we're going to do is say if n is equal to zero, let's increment the number of zeros. And if n is equal to one, let's increment the number of ones. Before we go further, I do want to quickly mention that you notice we're keeping track of the ones and zeros, but we're not really using both of these very much. Like we're not using them individually. We're only using them kind of together. So if you really wanted to, you could actually just have a single variable for both of these. Perhaps with ones, you could increment that variable and with zeros, you could decrement that variable. But for simplicity, I'm going to kind of keep it like this. I think being explicit is probably more helpful for beginners, but let me know if you'd rather me show the other solution. But now, Let's check something. Let's first calculate one minus zero. And what we want to know is if this is not already in the hash map, let's put it in the hash map because we only want the first one. So if this is not in diff index, let's add it to diff index and we will map it to the last index, of course. Okay, now there's a couple things. I mentioned earlier that there's kind of two cases. The first case is if they're equal. If one is equal to zero, the counts are equal. And that's easy because we know at that point, the result is just gonna be one plus zero because we know this is definitely the longest subarray that we've seen at this point because it starts literally at the beginning of the array. But the other case, maybe that's not true. Then we want to know so I'm going to make this an else if we want to know, does that difference one minus zero, is it already in diff index? And that's because if it is, then we can find the last index that it occurred at and then subtract it from I and then we'll get the size of our window. Then you kind of realize if you just like glance up at the code that we don't really need the else if here because we literally did that here. It must be inserted by the time we get here. 
We don't even need the else if, we'll just change this to an else. So we're guaranteed that this diff exists in the hash map. Then what we're gonna do is get the index of it. I'll just call that this. And then we'll say diff index, get that target diff, which is just one minus zero. Then to get the size of the window, let me just make sure all the code is visible. We're gonna set the result. Now we're gonna set it equal to the maximum because at this point, we're not guaranteed that this is the largest window like we were up here. So here we're gonna set this to be result or set it to be I minus the index. In some cases, this might end up being zero because if this was the first time that we're seeing this, then we're literally just taking I minus I and that's zero of course. But in some cases, it might be a large number. This is the entire code. Let's run it to make sure that it works. As you can see on the left, yes, it does. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.